How did you come up with this idea of writing this type of a book? I did not like the content, or at least most of the content that exists for these levels. Uh, they mainly have to do with uh, going to Greece, buying sublaki, watching the sunsets. Things that are stereotypically associated with Greece, and, and I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to do something that was deeper. Good day, Yorgos. Good day, Paulus. It's very nice to meet you. I'm really happy that you accepted my invitation. I was very glad to. Thank you. Where are you at the moment? I am in Aberdeen, Scotland. Right, but you're originally from Greece, as I know. I am, yes. I am from a small town in Greece. Uh, it's been about five, six years that I've been living here. Yeah. Right. I came here to study. I uh, came here to study linguistics. And then I stayed. Are you still studying or have you already finished? I finished. I did my bachelor's here and then did a master's in Leiden, in the Netherlands, in linguistics again. So, and then I came back. Wow, very cool. Very cool. So yeah. how, come, how did you get interested in linguistics? And maybe this will be our leeway to get into the Greek language as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... In Greece, I tried uh, studying uh, accountancy and finance when I finished school, which didn't end too well. I didn't graduate. And then I tried uh, college there, and I chose English literature, basically. Yeah, there we had some uh, linguistic uh, courses for linguistics, and uh, that's how I met linguistics. And... Uh, yeah, I really, I remember, I really liked it, and I thought that's what I should be doing instead of reading novels. Yeah, you know. very cool. In Greece, there is no way to study just linguistics uh, at uni. You have to study philology, which I was not too keen on. And uh, yeah, I searched and I applied to f for a few unis in uh, the UK and Aberdeen Academy, so I came. Right. And uh, is it during your studies that you got interested in uh, teaching Greek? Yeah, uh, but not through that. Uh, I was learning languages. I was into learning languages. And at some point I did uh, a few tandem sessions with a girl from Lebanon. And she would teach me Lebanese Arabic and I would teach her Greek. Ooh. I really enjoyed that. That was the first time I was ever teaching somebody. Uh, we didn't do many sessions together, but I, yeah. And then through meeting other language learners or, online and in real life, I realized that I enjoyed a lot uh, giving advice on Greek and basically answer questions like, I don't understand this, how does this work? And uh, when I came to Aberdeen, there is something here called the Aberdeen Scottish Hellenic Society. And uh, part of what they do is organize Greek lessons and, you know, like tell them an email and I became a teacher. So that was the first time I actually taught. Uh, was it difficult to start your career as a teacher? It was not very difficult. I was using a book uh, the first year, the book that the society was using. But I felt that it was confining me. And... Uh, during the summer, we did a spoken Greek class, and uh, then I decided to use my own material, and I saw that it flowed much, much better. I could do whatever I wanted to, and yeah. And nowadays, I don't use books at all. I just create my own material and only, only teach through it. When I was thinking about who is Yorgos Karabalos, uh, I was making notes for myself, and I noted down three things. So I noted that uh, Yorgos is a Greek teacher, that he's a founder of the YouTube channel Difficult Greek, and that he's the author of a book called Bit by Bit, a basic vocabulary builder for Greek. Should I add anything else? Well, uh, I'm actually a co-founder of the YouTube channel and the website and the project called Difficult Greek uh, in general. Uh, it's two of us. Uh, I create the material, and uh, my partner essentially 
four months at into what you see. So she produces the videos, she yeah, edits everything and yeah, creates and runs the website and uh, also formats the books. That's very beautiful. The animations are amazing. I really got captivated by how it looks and uh, I opened the website and I, I invited my girlfriends to say like, hey, give it a look. And uh, it, w it was very fun, very entertaining, very engaging. So it seems like a very good collaboration between you two. No, I'm very glad you liked it. Yeah, and I would say we see it as a partly we partly see it as an art form uh, as well. I, I it's all that we consider ourselves to be artists, but uh, yeah, it's like when you see when you watch a very well produced documentary, it, it, it teaches you something, but at the same time, it is a sort of art form. So yeah, that's that's basically how we see it. So how did you guys come up with this idea? Uh, there's a franchise called uh, Easy Languages. Easy French, Easy Polish. I don't know if you've come across it, Easy German on YouTube. No, not uh, yet. They do uh, interviews with native speakers on the street and you can learn the language, your target language through that. And uh, I was not very fond of the marketing around learning a language like uh, learn Greek in uh, five months uh, learn Greek in your sleep uh, <laughs> extremely easy Greek phrases and I wanted to embrace the the difficulty learning a language is difficult true that and that's fine I mean yeah even if it's a language that is very closely related to your native language. It's still a different code, a, a different system of communication. So, yeah. And uh, at the same time, difficult Greek refers to the fact that I don't teach stuff that are extremely easy mm -hmm. in the sense that I'm not going to teach the alphabet, for example, or I'm not going to teach you stuff like uh, how are you. The topics I choose are more specific and often have to do with the certain language structures and there are questions that people often have, essentially. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, the main had it over these two different levels, essentially, uh, about language is not easy no matter what you do about it. And uh, the Greek I choose to teach is not necessarily something that uh, a complete beginner uh, would want to watch. If we think about beginners in general, uh, and if we think about intermediate learners as well, so let's le leave advanced learners aside for the moment, but uh, if we're thinking about beginners, uh, what do you think they ought to focus on uh, when they start learning a new language? When you move from nothing to something, uh, what I try to teach them is, uh, well, for both things, I try to teach them essentially the same thing, but at a different level. So it's mainly about putting things together. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. for a beginner, I would teach them stuff like uh, words like uh, when or pronouns like uh, which, who, that. So the music that I listen to. Things that can work in small clusters within a sentence mm -hmm. and will allow you to uh, build longer and longer and be able to express yourself in general. For example, just to give an example of that, the music that I listen to is very nice because it makes me feel happy. If you think of each individual word, it's actually very, very simple vocabulary. You can actually give a beginner the tools to make it if they want to. And mm -hmm. it's a relatively long thing that expresses something potentially deep. So in your language classes, how do you structure mo most of them? Because some teachers just start a conversation, and if the conversation flows, they just carry on for the whole lecture. Other teachers have like a very strict plan, like they plan every activity with the minutes and like a controlled free exercises and so on. Uh, where do you find yourself uh, in terms of your approach to teaching? What we often do is we would uh, look at written language 
they would read and we can try to figure out what it says. Uh, basically about decoding, essentially. Mm -hmm. The class is not structured in the strict sense, so I don't actually plan out every single thing we're going to do. I might look at one word and tell them, okay, this thing, that's how we say it in Greek. How do you think we would say that thing based on what we saw here? Mm -hmm. So I tried to ask them stuff that would actually make them think and uh, allow them to think in the language. For example, you might say the word that means uh, Chinese, and they might ask me, what's that? And I would say that Chinese is from China. And then I might say, what is China? And then I say, China is a big, very big country in Asia. Then I might, then I might say something like Beijing is in China. Then, you know, they will get it eventually. When it comes to students progressing in the language, so, you know, mm -hmm. there are some students that really pick it up really quickly and they just mm -hmm. kind of skyrocket their progress from day one. And uh, yeah. other students are just like very slow and it seems like they're not getting anywhere. And there's those students that have their ups, plateaus, ups, plateaus, you know, it's, it's something yeah. in the middle. So what, what do you think are the main mistakes that students make in their learning process? Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily inside, just inside. It can also be outside of the lessons that kind of stifle their progress in language learning. Yeah, I would say, well, outside the lessons, I would say not having enough things that would motivate them. And by that, I mean, finding something that would actually, that you generally want to watch in this language, not because mm -hmm. you're doing it in order to learn the language, but I, I generally like this documentary and I want to watch it. and. It just happens to be in Greek, so I, uh, yeah, motivation is one thing outside the lessons. And the other thing I would say has to do with choosing things for the right level, for, for their, for their level. Uh, for example, some students try with material that is too difficult. Uh, a very common misconception is that if you're a beginner, you need to read children's books uh, mm -hmm. which is actually a big mistake uh, the books are written for kids who are native speakers of this language so neither the grammar nor the vocabulary is going to be easy just because they're written for kids uh, and yeah I come across this very often very often and that's also partly how I decided to write a book uh, but to be honest also what I do for like the the material I use for the lessons, the small, sh the short stories I produce, or the whatever, uh, are basically that, or just text adapted to each person's level. Coming back to your book, uh, you have mentioned that, uh, well, the name implies that it's a basic vocabulary builder for Greek. So it's... Its aim, I presume, is to help to build the necessary vocabulary for beginners. How do did, how did yes. students achieve that? How did you structure the book so it could happen? It, is, it consists of uh, 31 very, very short chapters. So let's say you're in bed and you want to read something very, very small, very short. If you're a beginner, you gotta read very long things. So every chapter, is first short and secondly it is composed of very very simple grammar and vocabulary so it's all written in the present tense the mm -hmm. only things that are not in the present tense can sometimes be the verb to be or the verb to have uh, but everything else mm -hmm. even when it tries to talk about the past tense it does it in the present tense somehow so, for example, mm -hmm. instead of saying, I remember I used to go to the park, they would say something like, I remember myself going to the park, which is present tense. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, yeah, it, it uses the most basic uh, uh, declensions and conjugations that A1 or A2 learners already know. 
And uh, in each chapter, there are words that are a bit more difficult, or at least that I deemed a bit more difficult. So these words are in the glossary, and each chapter has its own glossary. The book has three parts, basically. Uh, this is the first part I just described. The second part is is the same story, but every paragraph has its translation right under it. So it's paragraph translation, paragraph mm -hmm. translation. Uh, so if you still have not understood what it says, you can look at the translation. And the third part is uh, cool. all the glossaries combined. And uh, for some words, I add uh, a few comments. For example, that's how we use this one, or that's how it's different to that other synonym. Or, yeah. That's a lovely idea. How, how did you come up with this idea of writing this type of a book? Uh, was it difficult to do it? It was a bit difficult. Uh, if I have to do it again, it's not going to be difficult anymore. But uh, the reason why it was difficult is because the range of words you have is extremely limited. It uh, only has mm -hmm. to be words that an A2 or A1 le uh, learner would, would know, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's difficult to try and communicate different... Um, to try and communicate deeper emotions or something deeper through such a limited vocabulary. And I also, I was also writing it chapter by chapter, which means that I was trying to make each chapter uh, be able to stand individually. So, for example, each chapter could be uh, read separately as a story that does not necessarily have to connect to anything else. The main idea was I did not like the content, or at least most of the content that exists for these levels. Uh, they mainly have to do with uh, going to Greece, buying souvlaki, uh, watching the sunset, uh, going to the beach. Uh, things that are stereotypically associated with, with Greece and going on holidays to Greece. And I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to do something that was yeah, anybody could relate to, and it could express something, something deeper, uh, like something that could outline some a person's emotions in very simple words, which does not sound like it's trying to teach you something, but sounds as natural as it can be, but at the same time is very easily comprehensible by somebody who is uh, A2 or B1. That's amazing because uh, I also had an idea of writing a similar book for my Lithuanian students because when you say that there's uh, that you didn't like uh, the texts that are written for these levels that you can find, well, while you're saying Lithuanian, most probably you will not find any text at all. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing to find. There's almost no material for uh, these kind of levels. Yeah. So I thought that it might be a fun idea to write a, also like a short story book that maybe consists of like 20, 30 stories. And uh, yeah. I was thinking whether whether to make it in a, con in a narrative that's connected or like 30 separate stories. So I, I have written a couple of chapters, uh, but, but then life got in the way and it's just somewhere in my uh, Google Doc files. But it's still yeah. there, maybe like four chapters in. So so I might come back uh, at it, getting inspired from what you have told me about uh, your book on vocabulary building, because that was my idea as well. And uh, it seems like it's a very good supplementary kind of uh, material for students that are Mm -hmm. eager to learn not just in the classes but eager to learn on their free time what they are supposed to be doing actually because most of the learning doesn't come in class it comes after that so that's true so yeah, yeah. and when we, when we think about greek language in general uh i have heard from some greek speakers or someone on youtube i might be mistaken that Modern Greeks, so people from contemporary times, they can read 
ancient Greek texts, uh, mm -hmm. but likely they will not understand the meaning of the text because the word order, the words, they can read the words, but put it, put it together, they might not make sense. So, yes. but I still found it fascinating that they can read the text. So the, so the words, the alphabet, the grammar structure, it might have remained quite similar. So my question here would be, uh, how different is modern Greek from ancient Greek? And uh, in what ways is it still similar? Well, for starters, ancient Greek is much more complicated. You know, I guess languages have a tendency to become simpler as time progresses. Uh, for example, ancient Greek had a dative case. Uh, uh, Greek doesn't have a dative anymore. Uh, it also had more conjugation and declension paradigms, so more categories of verbs and nouns and whatnot. Uh, the pronunciation was, the phonology was different, basically. So if a modern Greek person reads an ancient Greek text, they would read it using modern Greek phonology. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but if an ancient Greek person, if a native figure of ancient Greek were to read the same text, they would be reading it much differently. Uh, so letters and combinations of vowels were read differently. And um, there are also some minor differences in the writing system. So some letters have disappeared. And uh, also ancient Greeks didn't have a lowercase system. So ah, these are not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was just what nowadays is capitals. Yeah, I would say the main differences are these. And the syntax was also different. Do you think that... Uh... A person from these times, let's say a person living in 2023, if he opens a, a book of, I don't know, Aristotle or, or Plato or, or Permanides, like whoever, uh, or some historians of those times, and they just started reading the text, how much of the text uh, would this uh, modern person be able to take in and understand? And how much of it would go like out the window? <laughs> From these particular people, not much. Uh, because they would be able to understand certain words, perhaps even a lot of words, but this doesn't mean that these words would mean the same thing in modern Greek. And mm -hmm. uh, if you try to put it together, yeah, you, you wouldn't really... I mean, ancient Greek, for a, for a modern Greek person, for a modern Greek speaker, ancient Greek needs to be taught as a, almost as a foreign language, I would say. Um, of course, not, not completely, but obviously you do have, uh, if you try to study all Lithuanian, you know, you, it wouldn't be as difficult for you as for, it would have been for me. Yeah, most definitely. But, uh, yeah. Like, you would have to teach them that's how this kind of thing was said or that's how you would say something like that. Uh, because the syntax was different. Just the way you would do things was was different. You have mentioned that there are declensions also in the Greek language. So that's, that's yeah. very interesting because not many Latin languages have declensions. Uh, let's true. say Lithuanian, Latvian, Russian... Ukrainian, um, a lot of, well, Baltic and Slavic languages, that's a common theme to have declensions. But uh, but, but the Latin languages, uh, I think not so much. So uh -huh. what, do you, what do you think? Uh, does it make it very confusing for students that come, up, come out of a language, let's say, that didn't have declensions to get a hang of it? Uh, how do you approach this topic? I usually talk about uh, the subject and the object in the sentence. Not everybody knows what that is, but I sometimes I have to explain that as well. And because mm -hmm. grammatical things is essentially about the the role of the word in the uh, in the sentence. But also, some of these languages still have uh, at least relics of uh, declension. For example. Especially in the personal pronouns, uh, for mm -hmm. instance, English and Spanish. Look, the the nominative 
would be I, whereas the accusative would be me. Or in Spanish, mm -hmm. the nominative would be yo, and the accusative would be me again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, through that, you can at least say, this is something they can understand. So through that, I, I generally understand that is a general thing that is important to be able to capitalize on uh, the languages your student already speaks if you also happen to know these languages and how they work so that you're able to compare structures and, and to compare structures and teach through that. And when we think about Latin and Greek, so can you maybe talk a little bit about their connection because they originated in similar region, uh, but, but they were, well, as I understand, in some time, uh, Latin replaced ancient Greek as the lingua franca of the region. Yeah. Uh, but I don't feel like they're that similar when it comes together. So how similar is Latin and let's say ancient Greek and maybe even modern Greek? Or, or is it uh, as similar as Lithuanian and English, meaning not so much? <laughs> I would say that if you try to compare the syntax of Latin and ancient Greek, there are there's a fair amount of similarities, especially the verb endings, I would say. Although, to be honest, you know, across the Indo-European family, you do find that a lot. Latin borrowed quite a lot from Greek, including the a large part of the alphabet. But uh, I wouldn't say that understanding one grants you understanding of the other in many case yeah maybe through some common words but that's as far as it gets and when we think about uh, greek and phoenicians or let's say persian language uh, is there a similar connection that uh, let's say the greeks and the persians have as the greeks uh, and the latin speakers have uh, is it also maybe uh, connected through the alphabet, uh, through the syntax, or or is it farther apart from, let's say, Greek and Latin? I would say it's further apart. Um, I mean, it's also further apart, literally. I mean, geographically speaking. Sure. Well, uh, there are still some loan words. The one I can think of is the word for paradise, which does come from Persian. Hmm. Yeah, paradise originally means a enclosed garden. Basically, that's the meaning of yeah, the original meaning of Persian. Yeah. About the Phoenicians, the language they spoke was completely unrelated to Greek, is a uh, Semitic, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But what happened is the Greeks borrowed the Phoenician alphabet and they adapted it to their own phonology. Mm -hmm. uh, Phoenicians didn't mark vowels, so what Greeks did was take some of the letters that represented Phoenician sounds that did not exist in Greek and turned them into Greek vowel sounds. So maybe right. a letter that would represent the sound w. Uh, they used this to represent the sound w, so it became the Greek epsilon eventually. The, the letter y in English. Gotcha. And let's say if a person would like to start learning Greek, uh, is it very diff difficult in terms of the pronunciation? Because uh, I have a friend that uh, is a Greek student. She is Bulgarian uh, by ethnicity, but she has uh, lived and lives still uh, in Greece. And uh, she said that there's so much different kind of tones for similar vowels. So maybe there's like five ways of how to say oh. <laughs> Uh, I might, I might be, uh, uh, I might be misleading uh, at the moment, but uh, just to clarify, uh, is it is it difficult in terms of the pronunciation? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, there are actually five ways to say e. There are two ways to say o, and two ways to say e. To give you an example, if you see an uh, a and an i together. This in Greek is read as e. In ancient Greek, it would have been read as i. 
but because pronunciation changed over time, but spelling did not, uh, you end up with some vowel combinations that throw some people off. Uh, the spelling is different. Not uh, sorry, the spelling is difficult. Not the pronunciation uh, is the same reason why English spelling is so weird. Is because mm -hmm. those words were pronounced differently originally, but their spelling did not change over time. So you end up with something completely unrelated to what you actually pronounce. Something similar happened with Greek. But yeah, I mean, this will take you about, I don't know, like, first of all, the writing system is taught in like one lesson or maximum two lessons. And after that, you just need to get used to, okay, wherever I see I, I say E. Eh. Wherever I see A, I say E. And so on. Another example would be with the two ways to represent uh, O, the O sound. Uh, you have uh, the letter Omicron, uh, which is like mm -hmm. the Latin O. And you also have the letter Omega. I guess most people have seen a capital Omega, mm -hmm. uh, either in physics or where else. Both of them represent an O sound, but in ancient Greek they were pronounced differently, so there was a reason why both of them existed. So Omicron literally means a, a small O, so O micron, as in micro, and O mega, mm. as in mega, like a big O. So Omicron was a short vowel, and Omega was a long vowel. Understood. And it's a common theme that uh, if uh, a person from the same language family learns a language, it will be easier for him to learn. Let's say if an Italian person starts learning Spanish, well, they, they have the benefit of knowing like 80% of the vocabulary. Uh, same mm -hmm. with Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. Portuguese and Italian are a little bit further apart, but still. When you think about Greek language, which languages are the closest to Greek? Or there are no such languages in general? I would say that there's no such languages. Thought so. so. <laughs> Basically, it it really depends. For example, I'll give an example. If you speak a Slavic language, you know how to distinguish between imperfective and perfective verbal aspect. And I guess this exists in other languages. Greek has the same system. So something that is quite complicated to explain to somebody who hasn't learned such a language, you've already got it. You don't need any more further explanation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you speak, for example, Spanish, which has a very large number of Greek loan words and almost the same phonology, or at least extremely similar phonology, you don't need to struggle with a pronunciation. And also the way the sentences are built is very, very similar. So... I guess each language gives you something different, but I wouldn't say there is a specific language that would really enable you to learn Greek much, much easier uh, compared to other languages. I'm not sure if it's... I have read that Armenian is closely related to the Hellenic branch, but I haven't told mm -hmm. any Armenians. Yeah, I don't really know how easy it would be for them. Yeah, that's what I wondered. I wondered if uh, there are any Hellenic languages that are still spoken besides Greek. There are, but all of them are endangered. So, <laughs> right. You have uh, Pontic Greek. Uh, you have the uh, Saconian, which is descending from the Doric dialects. Uh, you also have Cypriot Greek, which is not part of Standard Greek. Uh, obviously, you do have all the different Greek dialects, but you wouldn't really say they are separate languages. Yeah, to be honest, Greek is the only non-threatened language in the branch nowadays. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have mentioned that you were doing a language exchange uh, with a Lebanese girl, which was teaching you the Lebanese dialect of uh, Arabic. And uh, yes. in exchange, you were teaching her Greek. So first thing, uh, did you continue learning Arabic after that? 
And second thing, uh, what other languages have you learned or you have been learning? I haven't continued Arabic, actually. I would like to at some point. Uh, the languages I've learned are Spanish, Russian. I mention these two because Spanish, I would say, is my third best language. I am at C1. In Russian, I'm at uh, B2. So technically, I'm able to teach Greek in Spanish and in Russian. And I sometimes do that mm -hmm. if, if I have to. I would say my Italian is at B1, then French. Well, these are about A2, so it's French, Dutch, Swedish. Then I have a decent knowledge of Mandarin and uh, Turkish. That's a lot under your belt. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that I actually speak all those languages. I do know how most of them, how they work, how they function. I do understand the structures, but uh, I haven't practiced them that much, you know. Uh, the ones I can speak fluently are the, those four, so Greek, English, Spanish, and Russian. So when you think about uh, language learning, instead of teaching, so let's put you in the student seat. How do you approach language learning? Because you have mentioned very different languages. You know, Mandarin, Russian, and Spanish. Those are like worlds apart. So how do you structure your learning? And does it ever come a time when you, let's say, are learning two languages at once? I once made the mistake that many people have done to learn Spanish and Italian at the same time, and you end up mixing everything up. <laughs> uh, but uh, it really depends on how you're learning, like how seriously and how much effort you put into it. So if you decide to be very, let's say, systematic and very serious about it, then yeah, it can be a lot of work. If you are more of a casual learner, it probably doesn't really matter how many languages you're learning at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. And uh, I, I would say that it depends on how much pressure you choose to put on yourself uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to language learning. Like if you, let's say if you take up sports and you play, let's say, I don't know, football, hockey and basketball, and people might want to, okay, how do you manage all three? But yeah, if I only do each once per week, yeah, I can manage them very easily, you know, but if I trained very hard for mm -hmm. all three, it would have been, yeah. Actually, I think that uh, learning more than one language at once can be can be beneficial uh, because mm -hmm. you also get the chance to compare to different structures to each other and uh, draw parallels. True. So I don't think necessarily that is, it, it makes it more difficult. It also depends on whether you're learning by yourself or if you're following a, a structured course that requires, you know, to do, you know, a lot of homework or then, yeah, probably it would eventually get hard for you. But yeah, if you're learning by yourself, you can just regulate it to, according to your needs and my preferences. You have also told me uh, that you learned Russian. Uh, which is a mm -hmm. common language that me, we might have as well, because I also have been learning Russian for the past uh, three and a half years or something like that. And later on, I started learning Portuguese. So mm -hmm. I have been learning for Portuguese for like nine months. So there was a great difficulty when uh, I started mixing the words, even though they are not common yeah. languages. So yeah. uh, I'm thinking about... Uh, Portuguese words and Russian words come to my mind. I'm thinking about Russian and Portuguese words come to, into my mind. So does this happen all the time? Doesn't matter what kind of languages you're learning. And uh, does it end? Because it feels like for me, the words are not mixing anymore. It feels like finally I have managed to mentally kind of dissociate the vocabulary. Uh, but let's say your example of learning Spanish and Italian. Did it come a time when you were able to put them apart? I like to think that such time did come eventually, yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, 
What was interesting was when I was learning Spanish and Russian at the same time, you sometimes end up mixing up the paradigms, the conjugations, or for example, let's say, let's take the Spanish verb for to work, trabajar. Mm -hmm. I would accidentally apply Russian conjugation to it. <laughs> so I would say, trabaja yo, trabaja yesh, trabaja yet. Again, it's, I find there's a similar notion to when it comes to language being difficult. Language is also chaotic and that's okay. It's fine. You don't, I don't necessarily feel you have to uh, separate everything completely at any point in your life. It, it's fine if you mix them up. It's okay. That's good. That t takes away the tension because uh, many people are perfectionists when it comes to languages and I'm still getting bothered that I mix up the endings of uh, nouns in Russian or that I uh, mess up the tenses in the, my Portuguese. No, it, I, I still feel like being able to speak clearly without any mistakes would be lovely. But uh, if it's not your native language, well, it's very hard to reach such a level and you're not obligated to reach it. Like Exactly. For example, about what I said earlier on uh, the fact that when you learn more than one language at the same time, you can also draw parallels and they can help you. Even with Russian and Portuguese, which are very different to each other, what they both have is that a stressed vowel is pronounced differently to a non-stressed vowel. So, True. you know, they're two completely, okay, they're both Indo-European, but, and also, okay, the phonology is also very similar as well. The sounds are very similar. So even where you least expect it, you can still, it can still help you and facilitate your learning. What are the plans of Yorgos for the future? Uh, what are you planning to do, let's say, with your projects, uh, your own teaching career, and uh, maybe some future books? And uh, what personal projects for yourself as a learner do you have? Maybe you're planning to start learning a new language or uh, start a new hobby outside of the languages. Maybe languages are too much already for you. <laughs> so what are your future plans? It's true that I have, I'm not actively learning any language at the moment. I am, what I do more is uh, output rather than input. So I try to produce things for, for Greek. I would like to make more videos uh, and to cover more topics. I would also like to expand on other social media uh, and experiment with different types of format and presenting information, uh, either shorter or longer, who knows. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have already written uh, more books. I just haven't Ooh. published them yet. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah, I would like to write enough books for A1 or A2. Some of them will be very, very easy. Some of them will be tiny bit more difficult, but around that level, so that uh, to cover this gap, uh, essentially, that uh, there is now for learners. My main approach to teaching is that your teacher should teach you in such a way that you need them less and less. Mm -hmm. They should enable you to become an independent learner as soon as you wish and partly that's my plan with uh, with the books for example with the first book it tries to cover uh, a range of levels so it is good for for a1 it might be a bit difficult but they can still manage a2 is totally fine but also people at b1 can uh, read can benefit from it because what it does is that it helps them revise all the vocabulary that they have already learned but they might keep forgetting for example word you know greek has a very long word for at least 
mm-hmm. or whereas like uh, I don't know in general, for example, and this connecting words are very useful or some structures that they might be getting wrong. So yeah, I try to cover a sort of wider range of of levels. And maybe the last question that I want to ask, because you have been living uh, abroad for the past five years, from what you have mentioned before, uh, do you ever miss Greece? And if you miss it, uh, what do you miss it for? I mainly miss my family and friends, I would say. I don't necessarily miss the country itself. I mean, I do enjoy going there, but yeah. It's not like I would go to Greece just to go to Greece. I would go to Greece to see certain people. Yeah. I also miss being surrounded by the language. Uh, that I do miss, yeah. That I do miss. That's good. Like, uh, not being homesick is a good state to be in. Because homesickness, so? it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, uh, living in Portugal, I have been missing a little bit of Lithuanian nature, mainly mm. trees. Uh, but you have mm-hmm. a lot of those in Aberdeen. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. we we were also, I and my girlfriend, we were having ideas to maybe visit Scotland one day uh, because I really? haven't been to Scotland before. And and uh, my girlfriend is a big Harry Potter fan, so go figure. And uh, gotcha. if we ever come Brilliant. to Aberdeen, it would be lovely to also meet you in person. And uh, it was yeah. very, very nice. That'd be lovely. Sure, me as well. <laughs> and also, if you if you're in uh, Madeira or uh, somewhere around, please give me a notice. Okay. So thank you, Yorgos. Thank you very much for for having me.